but by me, but by me. Uh, if you would, we're in the book of Ephesians tonight, the book of Ephesians, one of the Pauline epistles, a prison epistle. Ephesians, we're going to be in chapter number two. You go, oh, preacher, I've heard this message a hundred times before. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The exposition is going to be a little bit different tonight. And, uh, you know, I just attributed that to just, uh, you know, maturing in the Lord and just uh, seeing things that perhaps, you know, God's not showed me before. And, you know, I pray it will be a blessing to each and every person here tonight. If you would, uh, if you found your place, Ephesians chapter number 2, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2, verse number 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, Amen. even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, I thank you for the services this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the visitors that came in the last few moments of the service. Father, I pray for those who weren't able to be with us this evening. I pray, dear God, that, uh, Lord, that you would deal with them, Father, and that you would help them wherever they are, Lord. Father, uh, I pray that they'll open their Bible tonight and perhaps, Father, look and ponder upon your word. Father, that they might come and dine, Father, uh, on the, the promises, Lord, and the provision that are all within this wonderful, marvelous book that you've left us called the Bible. Father, I pray now, dear God, that uh, you would just uh, give me uh, power, Father, to preach tonight, Lord. I pray, dear God, that I would be clear. I pray, dear Lord, that you allow me to be direct. I pray, dear God, that the word of God would go out and touch people's hearts tonight, Lord. I pray, dear God, that we might all be touched and made a little bit different as a result of hearing from you. Father, it's not me. It's not the sound of my voice, Lord. But it's the power of the word of God that will reach and touch souls and hearts. And now, Father, I ask, Lord, that you would come meet with us this evening, Lord, for a short period of time here. Father, that you would just manifest your presence. That you would bless us, Father. That you would help us, Father, to see clearly what you have given us in this wonderful passage of Scripture, Lord. Help me to be thorough, Lord. Help me to be mindful, Lord. Help me, dear God, to just preach, Father, in love and in truth. And now, Father, forgive me of any transgressions in my life, Father. Help me to be that wrestle worthy tonight, Lord, to bring the word of God. Father, help us all, Father, in our hour of need here. Lord, we pray for new souls. We pray for people. Father, we pray that this mailing would go out, Father, and really speak and draw people to this church. Father, we ask now, dear God, that you would do what we cannot, Father, for we ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen and amen, and you may be seated. The title of the message this evening is, The Mercy and Grace of God. The Mercy and Grace of God. 
You know, it's good to, to be reminded every once in a while where we came from and how far God's grace and mercy has carried us and moved us. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, God said, that's the passage of Scripture as I studied this week. This is what I want you to preach on. I said, but Lord, I've preached on this Scripture many times. And he said, well, preacher, you just need to get in there and dig a little bit deeper. And so I started digging a little bit deeper. May I say this? What Paul wrote to the church of Ephesians 2,000 years ago still provides the answers to the questions and problems that everyone still has today. With no exceptions, everyone is a sinner by nature because of Adam's transgressions. Romans 3.23 reminds us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, we disobey God through wrongful actions and our refusal to obey His instructions and commandments. If you would, hold your place in Ephesians and go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 5. And we'll read a few verses of Scripture out of Romans chapter number 5. I believe they'll bless your heart. It's the Pauline discourse on the Edemic curse. I believe that uh, all of us need to read that and understand what occurred because we've all, we're all, uh, we're all under the curse. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse number 12, Wherefore, wherefore as by one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. Not some, but all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. In verse number one of our scripture, we're told that we're sinners. As a sinner, we are dead in trespasses and sins. Go back to the book of Ephesians. I want you to follow the scripture now closely, because I'm going to preach expositively from the scripture. The Bible tells us in verse number 2, verse chapter 2, verse number 1, and you have he quickened or made him alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You see, the death that the Bible speaks about is a spiritual death, which represents spiritual separation from God. You see, you can't be right with God because you're a sinner and God is perfectly holy. Therefore, you can't enter into His presence and you are not on your way to heaven because your sins are in the way. There is something wrong between you and God that needs to be fixed. And that, my friends, is the point of verse number one, the plight of the sinner. Verse number one shows us clearly the plight of the sinner. Beginning in verse number one, we're told that we are dead because of our trespasses and sins. 
In verse number two, we find out that we are sinners because we are going in the wrong direction. Quickly, look at your verse. Look at verse number two. Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world. When you walk according to the course of this world, you are walking, my friends, in the wrong direction. Right. Verse number two shows us clearly that we're walking in the wrong direction. And we're disobedient. Look at the last word in verse number two. That now we're in the children of disobedience. So verse number two shows us clearly that we are walking in the wrong direction and that we are disobedient. Now watch your Bible now. Religion tells us that there is a God somewhere. Amen. And although I don't know him, I'm going to try my best to find him. And I'll go to church. Maybe I'll get baptized. Maybe I'll give a little bit of money to the church. Maybe I'll just try and be a good person. You know what I'll do? I think what I'll try to do is I'll try to live a moral life the best that I can in hope that someday, somehow, I'll be able to get to God. And God will let me in based on what I have done. Now what I just shared with you is exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Amen. God's Word says none of us are getting better or drawing closer to God. We are all headed in the wrong direction because of our sin without exception. Isaiah 53, 6. The Bible is very clear. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. According to verse number 1, to be a sinner means that I'm dead in trespasses and sin. Now look at that last word in Ephesians 2, 2, disobedience. Because of my sin, not only am I headed in the wrong direction, but I am disobedient to God. God says don't, and I say do. God says wrong, and I say right. Therefore, because of these three things and these two verses, the third verse closes with the following words. Let's look at verse number three. Among whom also we all had our conversation, or were citizens or partakers in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and look at this, underline this, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, the children of wrath. Now, in addition to everything we've already identified about our sinful condition in verses 1 and 2, according to the Bible, in verse number 3, I'm under the wrath or the judgment of God. I'm not on my way to heaven, but condemned by God to an eternity separated from God to a place called hell. I say to you this evening, it's a serious thing to be a sinner separated from God. So first we see the plight of the sinner. But now I want you to quickly notice the plan of the Savior. The plan of the Savior. But notice the transition that takes place in verse number 4. Verse number 4 is a glorious verse because of the first two words. But God. But God. Verse 1 tells me I'm dead in trespasses and sin. Verse 2 tells me I'm going in the wrong direction and disobedient. Verse 3 says I'm under God's wrath. But verse 4 says, but God. I'm telling you, my friends, that's shouting ground. Because whenever God shows up and gets involved, something is about to change. Glory to God. Amen. Can I tell you tonight, it's okay to get excited about God. Amen. Amen. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. You see, something miraculous happens in verse number 5 of our scripture that changed our very standing before God. God made us a way for sinful man to be reconciled back to him. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, or to Romans 5 again, hold your place. Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. I want you to see these scriptures. Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. 
The Bible tells us in verse number 6, For when we were yet without strength, I like that, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Mm. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure, that word peradventure means by chance. Peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God's word, Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Amen. I'm telling you what, something miraculous happens in verse 5. Go back to your scripture. Go back to the scripture. Go back to Ephesians. Chapter number 2, verse number 5, the Bible tells us, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace we are saved. Even, look what the Bible says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. That's the power of God, my friend. That's the power of God to forgive. That's the power of God to restore. Amen. That's the power of God to reconcile a lost man back to him. Acts 4.12 tells us, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now according to the Bible, Jesus is the only way to be saved. The Apostle Paul said, There is one God and one mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy, hold your place, you might as well go there, mark it in your Bible, 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6, amen, you get to 1 Timothy 2, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, amen, and the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So we see the plight of the sinner. We see the plan of the Savior. And now we see the price of salvation. The price of salvation. Oh, my friends, I love verse 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 in our scripture. For by grace are you saved through faith. And then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Amen. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Right. Grace is unmerited favor. Because we don't deserve to go to heaven. That's right. Let me say that again. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's also grace, it's God's love and mercy being extended to you and I. Because we don't deserve. But what God did for you and I is called grace. And God loves and cares about you and I, and he desires that none should perish, die, or go to a devil's hell. The reason we are here tonight is because we know a risen Savior who works in our lives and draws men to himself. Grace is everything God did for you, and I bring and I to bring us back into a right relationship with Him. That's God's grace. Everything He did to get you to where you are tonight, sitting in this Baptist church, listening to the Word of God being preached, where would you be tonight? You certainly wouldn't be here if you had not been reconciled with God. Amen? God did for you what we couldn't do for ourselves. You see, your past is not important to God. But your eternal destination is. And that is why he willingly sent and gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins and for mine.
Can I tell you that salvation is in a process? It doesn't come in an installment plan. It's immediate, it's whole, and it's complete. In the Nicodemian discourse, John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews, that he must be born again. Go to John chapter number 3. I know you say, preacher, I hear this verse all the time. Have you memorized it yet? Amen. John chapter 3. The whole point is memorize it. Get it in your heart. Keep it there so it will be there when you need it. Amen. John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into what? The kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. My friends, you'll never get to heaven unless you experience the second birth, and ye must be born again. Not only is salvation immediate and complete, it's a gift according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is God's gift to sinful man. Amen. Notice verse 9 tells us it's not of works. There is absolutely nothing you or I can do to earn it. In our scripture tonight, first, Paul explains how to be saved and know for sure that you're going to heaven. He explains how your sins can be forgiven and how to become a child of God. But secondly, Paul exhorts us that are saved people to rejoice in what God has done for us. We need to rejoice in what God has done for us. I hope you realize that this scripture is addressed to those who are saved or have been born again. Let's make sure you understand that. You see, this scripture is not written to the lost. It is written to the saved. Let's take a look at that. You'll see the past tense of the verb. And you hath he quickened who were dead. Who were dead. That's past tense, my friend. He is writing this to those that are saved and heaven bound and in a right way with God. You should rejoice that you're not dead anymore. Amen. 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 You should rejoice, but alive in Christ and a child of the King. Amen. Rejoice that your sins have been forgiven, washed away, and never to be remembered anymore. You should rejoice that you're heaven bound and you're part of God's family. Look carefully at Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us together, sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know what that means to you and me? Let me explain it to you very simply. Everything Jesus has, I have, because I'm part of God's family. Right. Mm -hmm. Everything that Jesus has, I'm entitled to, and I have, because I'm part of God's family. Can I ask you a question? I thought about this. Knowing who and what I was, why would God save somebody like me? Why would God save somebody like me? The answer comes in verse number 7. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The purpose is so that in all the ages to follow of the world, that he who saved those sinners at Ephesus is still able and still ready to save all who, like them, are willing to repent of their sins, believe in Jesus Christ, and trust in him for the finished work at Calvary. In heaven there will be a great host, quickened from death, which are now holy, free from sorrow, and the eternal monuments of the grace of God. You know, that's what you're going to be one day. One day you're going to be an eternal monument of the grace of God in heaven for all of eternity. Can you imagine me? I can't imagine me being an eternal monument for all of eternity because of the grace of God. Do you know what you need to do today? You need to rejoice. Amen. You need to rejoice in what God has done for you. Amen. You should rejoice and shout the glory that God loves you. Put a smile on your face and let others see the joy of the Lord that lives within you. 
By the way, how long has it been since you've been wowed by the grace of God that has been bestowed upon you? You see, a lot of us have lost that wow. You know what? I'm amazed every day. I'm amazed every day that God would save a sinner like me. And because of that, I'm still wild. I'm wild every time I open the Bible. I'm wild every time I walk through these doors. I'm wild every time I stand in this pulpit. I'm wild every time I still see a sinner get saved. Amen. Amen. It's good to be wild. Amen. Oh, it's good to be wild. And it's good to smile. And it's good to know that you belong to God. So first Paul explains how to be saved. And to know for sure that you're going to heaven. He then explains how your sins can be forgiven and how to become a child of God. Secondly, Paul exhorts us in our say to rejoice in what God has done for us. Finally, Paul encourages us as believers to walk in good works. Amen. Verse number 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are His workmanship. We are His creation. We have been molded. We have been shaped by the Word of God. We have been shaped by the mercy and love of God. You say, well, what is, give me an illustration, preacher. Go to Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 18. The prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 8. Let me take you to the potter's house for just a moment. The potter's house. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 18, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there will I cause thee to hear my words. Boy, you know, it's good to get down to the potter's house every once in a while. It's good to, every once in a while to be in God's house, amen. And there you will hear the word of God being preached, amen. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Amen. Those wheels are symbolic. Those wheels represent you. And they represent me. And the, what it really is, it's the Holy Spirit of God working on you and I. And the water represents the Word of God. You see, you need two things to change. You need the Word of God and you need the Holy Spirit of God to draw you to God. And at the potter's wheel, Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house and he sees this man working a work on a wheel. And he's reminded and God is showing him and telling him, Jeremiah, do you not understand? Do you not see that I've taken a worthless lump of clay, a piece of ground, and I've taken it and I've put it upon my wheel? You see, that wheel's God's wheel, and that's the wheel that God shapes each and every one of us in. And God takes us and He molds us and He shapes us and He corrects everything that's wrong. And then, just as soon as you think it's done, you know what God does? He sticks His hand deep down inside because, you know, a lot of things look good on the outside, but they're not good on the inside. And you know what he does? He gets deep down in there and he just starts grabbing and grabbing and you know what? He removes all the impurity. He removes all the imperfection until he has you exactly the way that he wants you to be. Oh, my friends, God is good. Oh, God is powerful. Oh, God is God. I am that I am that I am. Amen. Amen. It says, Then I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. You know that person down there, that wheel? He could take that clay and mold it and shape it any way he wants. And so it is with God. God has a plan for your life. And if you'll just go down to that potter's wheel, God will get a hold of you. He'll take you. He'll mold you. He'll shape you. He'll direct you. He'll make you exactly in the likeness that he's seeking. Oh, you just got to be willing to go, my friend. You just got to be willing to go. And so he made it. Listen to what he says. The clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel. You know what he discovered? It wasn't what it needed to be. So he started over again. Do you know why? Because he desires you to be right. He desires you to be the best that you can be. He wants to make sure that you're just as shiny on the inside as you are on the outside. 
You know, you are sitting here. Your trophies of grace. This is God's show over right here. This is God's show. You are a trophy of God's grace. Amen. You are a trophy of God's grace and mercy. You see? And we're here. We're here for a reason. So that others can walk in and see God's trophies on display. Amen. But we're not supposed to stay here, see? We're supposed to leave these people. We're supposed to go out. We're supposed to go and witness. We're supposed to go and speak to others. We're supposed to go and tell people about God. Now listen. That clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? How about old Grace Bible Baptist Church? Can I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O Grace Bible Baptist Church. You know what God has been doing for the last few years down there? He's been molding us. He's been shaping us. He's been molding and shaping this building. And finally, we're getting to the point now where the building is where it needed to be. My friend, you have to understand, this was not pleasing in the sight of God when we were in this building. This was a cardboard box, and it was suffocating, and it wasn't bringing and giving glory to God. You see, we could have just did nothing and left it exactly the way it was, but that's not what God would have us to do. Sally, you've said it many times. We need to take care of this because this is God's house. And in God's house, God's house has got to look good. Amen. God's house needs to be right. And God's house should shine like a light that would blind you the moment you walk in. Amen. I'm telling you what, I'm glad that we have people here that care about what God thinks. I'm glad that we have people here that want to honor God and do the right thing. Amen. God will honor us. You just let God get in our business and go, who get it? We'll get in his business and everything's going to be okay. Now, we are saved that we might perform good works to the glory of God and the benefit of man. Don't you be discouraged about where you're at right now. Maybe you're running into a brick wall. Maybe you're having a little bit of problem. But just make sure that you stay on the right path, the straight and narrow, the path that God has placed before your feet. Don't give up if things aren't turning out the way you thought they ought to be or the way they should be. Just keep working at it. You know what you need to do? Allow God to work on you and in you for His glory. Allow God to work on you and in you for His glory. If you're saved, the God in heaven wants you to live the victorious Christian life. If you believe that, say amen. amen. God wants you to live the victorious Christian life. He doesn't want you to live down in the dull drums. He doesn't want you to be discouraged. He wants you to be lifted up. He wants you to be encouraged. Why? So that we can encourage others. So people can see the light shining that resides within you and I. Allow God to work on you and in you for His glory. If you're saved, the God in heaven wants you to live that victorious Christian life. And at the end of verse 10 in our scripture, the Bible tells us that we are to walk in these good works. Walk in these good works. Now let's take a look. Go back to our scripture. Go back to Ephesians. We're coming to a close here. Amen. I enjoyed working on this message. This message really uh, stretched me a little bit. But boy, I'll tell you what. I love it. That we are told to walk in these good works. Look at Ephesians 4.1. Ephesians 4.1. Ephesians 4.1 shows us the worthy walk. Are you walking the worthy walk? What's the worthy walk? The worthy walk is a walk that's pleasing to God. The worthy walk is the walk that puts God first in your life. The worthy walk is the one that helps you to witness to other people. To do all the things that God has commanded you to do. I therefore... A prisoner of the Lord. Boy, it's good to be a prisoner of the Lord. Amen. It's good to be a prisoner of the Lord. Lord, thank you, Lord. Beseech you 
that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. I don't care if you're a fireman. I don't care if you're a railroad engineer, a pilot, a fighter pilot, teaching a Christian school, work at a cash register. I don't care what you do. Work at the dog pound. It don't matter. Walk worthy of the vocation that God has given you. God has a plan for your life. Oh, that's it. You need to laugh. You need to laugh. You need to smile. You just need to understand that God's way is the right way. And God's way is always the best way. And there's no other way except God's way if you're going to have peace and you're going to have joy in your heart. You see, we need to rejoice tonight. We need to rejoice that we're saved, that God quickened us while we were dead in our trespasses and sin. So first we see the worthy walk in Ephesians 4.1. Now look at Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 2. And walk in love. It's the walk of love. You know, truth be known, there's just some people that are hard to love. Amen. Anybody ever met somebody that was hard to love? There's some people that are just hard to love. And we just can't love everybody. Although we may try and we want to, and God commands us to, sometimes it's just hard. But God has saying to us, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Oh, you got a problem loving somebody else? God sure didn't have no problem loving you, did he? Right. Amen. God gave you the grace. God gave you the mercy that we didn't deserve. God gave you a second chance. God lets you be born again. Amen. God forgot your sins as far as the east is from the west. They are removed, never to be remembered anymore. You see, the God of the Bible loves you. The God of the Bible desires only the best for you. The God of the Bible wants to make sure that you walk the walk of love as Christ loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Oh, do everything unto it unto the Lord. Do it with a smile on your face. Don't do it begrudgingly. Do it because you love him. Do it because he loves you. Do it because you're thankful. Do it because you're grateful. Because he is God. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, we see another walk. It's the walk of circumstance. The walk of circumstance. You know what that word circumstance means? Let's see, you'll, you'll see the contrast in the words. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What the Bible is telling us that we need to walk carefully, cautiously, understanding the ramifications of everything that we do. You see, for every action, there is a reaction. He's basically telling us about the law of reaping and sowing. We'll reap what we sow. Right. But he would have us to reap joy, peace. You see, he loves us tonight. And as believers, we are to walk in the light and not in the darkness. You see, I believe too many people are walking in darkness tonight. And that, my friends, is the reason why the world is in the shape that it's in tonight. Because people are walking in darkness. Why? Because men love darkness more than light. Because their deeds are evil. You know what America needs? America needs to get on their knees. America needs to plead and cry out to God. And just say, oh, God. Oh, God, give us our country back. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, give us our country back. That's right. Give us our families back. Give us our churches back. Give us our government back. Oh, God, I beseech you, therefore, your God, that you would just work as only you can. You see, if America would just fall on their knees and bow before a holy, mighty, almighty, omnipotent God, then God would do something. Have you prayed for America to fall to their knees? I think we ought to. I think we need to. 
So I'm closing now. I just have a few questions for you. Number one, as a pianist comes and begins to play a human invitation, here's the first question for you tonight. Are you living the Christian life in private? That's a good question. Are you living as a Christian when there's no one around? Are you living the Christian life when there's no one there to look over your shoulder and say, that's not right. The Holy Spirit should be doing that anyway. But what I'm saying is, are you still godly when nobody else is around? Are you who you say you are? Oh, I know we all walk, we all talk the talk, but are you walking the walk when there's nobody else around? You know, anybody can be godly in church, or at least act like they're godly. People come and they get dressed up to church. You come and we're dressed up and, you know, you just don't know. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a different vocabulary at all? Do you have at home? What are you feeding yourself at home? And no, I'm not talking about spaghetti dinners, amen. No, I'm talking about what are you putting before your eyes? What are you listening to? How are you treating those in your household? Do you love them? Do you love them unconditionally? Do you care for their souls? You see, you're spiritual here at church. But what are you when you're at home? Are you just as spiritual at home as you are here in church? You know, some of you know that you're not reading the Bible as much as you should. Some of you know that you're not praying as much as you should. Guilty. Guilty. Oh, you're not a long home. Guilty. Amen. Guilty. Guilty as charged, Lord. So what are you going to do about it? We need to address it. We need to address it. You know where the power comes from? comes from God. You know, we get that power on your knees, prostrate before God, and say, oh God, help me to be what you want me to be all the time, not sometime. Not only in public, not when I'm just in church, but help me to live that life, be that witness and that testimony in my home. You see, there's a lot of men that go to church, and there's a lot of men that have families, and they go home, and you know those men? They're wife beaters. And then they beat their wives. They just they disgrace them. They put them down. That's all they know how to do. Oh, God, help them. There's some women that are just flower women. And they're so bitter. They're so embittered that they don't know what to do. Oh, God, help them. Meanwhile, there's some little children running around. There's some little children running around. And they're suspect. And they hear all of these things. And they see them going on. Oh, God, help us. God, help us.
Have you lost your joy? I fear that far too many Christians have lost their joy. You see, those old hymns, they still get me excited. I don't know about you, but I open up that hymnal and I start singing those old hymns, and I'm reminded of the power of God. I'm reminded of the grace of God. I'm reminded of the mercy of God. I'm reminded that the God that I serve is the God of the universe, the eternal God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending. There's none other like Him, and there's no one that you can compare Him to. Amen? You see, the old hymns and the preaching, the old paths, the old way, the old landmarks, when preachers used to preach about sin, when preachers used to cry to people, who just cry out and say, oh God, come back to God, return to God. If we'll just do that, if we'll get in God's business, God will get in our business. As we stand to our feet this evening and we sing a hymn of invitation, hymn number 296, if God spoke to your heart, and even from the quietness of your pew, God spoke to you, look, are you living a Christian life in private? Are you living a Christian life at work? And have you lost your joy? You know, God can give you that joy back tonight. Oh, joy, can God can put that joy right back in your heart. But you know what you got to do? You got to tell him you want it. You got to tell him that you need it. You got to tell him, I don't know how I got along without it. 296. Rock and God.
Heavenly Father, Father, at this time we thank you for that message, Father. We thank you for the service we had this evening. Father, we thank you for the service we had this morning. Father, we thank you for the people who are here. Father, we also pray for the people who are not. Father, we pray that you be with us and refresh our memories as the days go on, Father, about the way we should be walking with you, Father. Father, we know there are times that we take the wrong path. But, Father, we know that uh, if we just turn back to you, Father, we know that you'll forgive us and bring us back to the path we should be on, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for the people who are lost. Mm -hmm. We pray that they would also find the path, Father. Father, we know that you can guide them once they find it. Father, now as we depart from this building, Father, we, uh, we pray for safe travel as we all go to our different destinations. And Father, may we return again uh, Wednesday at uh, approximately 4.30 for our business meeting. And Father, in the meantime, we pray that you just watch over us and guide us and protect us. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name.